Today, I want to show you one of Germany's westernmost regions, the Eiffel. Its impressive landscapes are the result of a fascinating past, and this is where you get the best view, the top of the Eiffel's highest mountain. In the past, the Eiffel was a rather poor region. Today, the low mountain range with its forests, lakes, and extinct volcanic craters has become an attractive tourist region. The small city of Monchau near the Belgian border is nicknamed the Pearl of the Eiffel. Its historic old town attracts tourists from all over the world. In July of 2021, horrendous flooding devastated large parts of the Eiffel. Monchau was left pretty much unscathed, but still had trouble dealing with the fallout of the catastrophe. The tourism sector was severely affected by the flood. Barbara Frohnhoff is the city's tourism manager. How did the catastrophe impact tourism here? Very drastically, unfortunately. From the reports in the media, people assumed that the entire Eiffel region was affected by the flooding crisis and that everywhere had been devastated. Just think, the extreme rain happened on Thursday, and then by Friday and Saturday, some businesses were receiving up to 40 cancellations a day. If you remember that these businesses were just emerging from a seven-month lockdown, then that was particularly hard. The hopes for a good season were especially high. It seems to me that Monschau is bustling with activity. But Barbara Frohnhoff tells me that despite this being the high season, tourist numbers are far below average. According to scientists, the flooding of 2021 can be largely attributed to human-made climate change. But already 700,000 years ago, enormous natural events shaped the Eiffel. This unusual landscape is the result of powerful volcanic eruptions. I'd like to find out more about the exciting volcanic history of the Eiffel. So, I'm meeting up with an expert. People around here call the Mars the eyes of the Eiffel. How many of them are there? Of the 350 volcanoes that we have in the region, 77 have been shown to be Mar volcanoes. Nowadays, not all of them are filled with water. Most are dried out, or bog or moorland. But the most recent ones in particular, the ones that formed over the last 80,000 years, including Germany's most recent volcano, the Ulmener Mar, 12 of those 77 Mars are crater lakes. Davon sind, sind dann insgesamt von den 77 12 bis heute noch mit Wasser gefüllt. And by the way, the scientists agree that the volcanic area of the West Eiffel cannot be described as extinct. That was my next question. Is it still seething under our feet? It is still bubbling away under our feet. There aren't any eruptions anymore, but you can tell that it is bubbling away because of the rising carbon dioxide. Let's take a look. A closer look. At the heart of the Eiffel lies the small town of Wallenborn, home to a real geyser. It's nicknamed Brubel and shoots cold water into the air every 30 minutes. Here, the activity under the surface is very clear. How does the geyser work? Brubel is a cold water geyser. 
That means that it is not triggered by temperature, but by CO2, carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is being given off by the magma deep in the Earth's crust. The CO2 rises and comes into contact with water. The CO2 percolates into water, the water absorbs a certain amount of CO2 until it reaches saturation point. And then the first gas bubbles are formed. They collide with one another and continue to grow in size. They rise upwards. And the result of this self-amplifying effect is that Brubble, the cold water geyser, shoots up into the air. Water, wind, fire and earth. Few regions in Germany have been as significantly shaped by the elements as the Eiffel. The resulting diversity of flora and fauna can be admired at Eiffel National Park. The motto here is, let nature be nature. Without human interference, endangered species of animals and plants can spread freely. If you really want to dive into nature, I highly recommend a guided tour with a ranger. This is where the primeval forest of the future is set to develop. What exactly does that mean? Well, we will never get the primeval forest per se back. There is hardly a square meter left in Central Europe. But the primeval forest of the future will be something similar, if we people stop interfering and the whole thing can develop over centuries. We have to think in tree generations here. We have to wait for a bit, unfortunately, but a lot is already happening. The forest is already changing. When trees fall over, break in two, when there are storms or bark beetles attack, Trees. Elsewhere, conifers killed by vermin are instantly removed. But here in the national park, they're left to rot. Seeds dropped on the dead wood by birds and other creatures create new life. stop was once a prominent place in the darkest chapter of German history. Smack in the middle of the National Park lies the former Nazi estate and castle Ordensburg Vogelsang. It was a training center for future party leaders. And where Vogelsang once stood for the propagation of dehumanizing values, today it's a space dedicated to remembrance and the celebration of diversity. You can learn about the history of Vogelsang in a permanent exhibition. Back in the day, young men were indoctrinated with Nazi ideology and received military and sports training here. The self-titled Ordensjunker were supposed to come close to their ideal of a superior German man. Today, Vogelsang is an international meeting place and research institution. From Germany's more recent history back to the distant past. Quite remarkable that 13,000 years ago, this peaceful lake was the site of the biggest volcanic eruption in Central Europe to date. A thick layer of volcanic ash and pumice buried meadows, valleys and forests. Ansgar Heenkamp is a fisher on Lake Lacha See. 14 years ago, he leased the lake from the neighboring Benedictine Maria Lach Abbey and decided to continue the monks' centuries-old fishing tradition. 
While you're at it, do you mind explaining to me how it works? It looks very peculiar. In principle, it's a classic pelagic method. The nets aren't attached to the lake bottom and the top line doesn't weigh anything. Below, there is a line with a lead weight that spans the whole thing. It's a bit like a curtain. The fish swim inside and the mesh determines the size of fish we catch. This fish is at the smaller end of the spectrum. It weighs about 200 grams. We catch up to 300 to 350 grams. Smaller fish simply swim through, bigger ones can also get caught, but not as well. It's selective fishing. The volcano under the lake is not yet extinct. There are still visible discharges of carbon dioxide. They're called mofeta. So volcanism is still very visible here, isn't it? Yes, here. That's why all the tourists come. You can even see them from the shore. There are a lot of places where you can't. If the mafetas are 40 meters down, I can see them on my echo sounding device when I look for fish. Something resembling a Christmas tree rising from the bottom. But you can't see that with the naked eye. Not far from the lake lies Maria Lach Abbey. The medieval monastery was founded a thousand years ago and is arguably the most famous building of the Eiffel. The basilica, with its six towers, is the centerpiece of the abbey. It's one of the most beautiful and intact Romanesque monuments in Germany, following the tradition of the big cathedrals in the cities of Speyer, Mainz, and Worms. With its craters, volcanic lakes, and historic sites, the Eiffel really is an exceptional region. The sheer variety one can find here is truly hard to match. So thank you for discovering it with me today, and I'll see you next time somewhere in Germany.